Hey everyone, and welcome to Candidate Conversations. My name is Ellen Dennis, and I'm the state government reporter at the Spokesman Review newspaper. Today, I'm joined by Phil Fortunato, a Republican candidate running for state insurance commissioner. Phil, thanks so much for being here today. Well, thank you, Ellen. Um, to begin with, I want to ask you, why are you running for state insurance commissioner, and why should voters pick you? Uh, a couple of reasons. One, you know, many people don't realize that the insurance commissioner's office is different than every other executive office position in that what the insurance commissioner's power is like 80 percent rulemaking. So it's not law. So he doesn't, you know, if you if you elected me secretary of state, for example, I have to follow the law. So it doesn't matter who you elect secretary of state. If you don't like the, the 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 laws that they have to follow, the Secretary of State still has to follow them, whether he likes them or not. The insurance commissioner's office, though, has very few rule of laws that he has to follow compared to his rulemaking ability. In other words, uh, so his rulemaking ability. So um, an example is, if you recall, there was a, uh, a law about the uh, using your insurance or your, uh, uh, what is it, the, uh, I'm drawing a blank now, voter, uh, not voter, I'm sorry, your uh, credit scores, your credit scores to uh, adjust your insurance rates. So that was a bill that was in the legislature that did not pass the legislature that the insurance commissioner simply implemented by rule. So uh, he didn't pass a law in the legislature. The governor didn't sign it. He just simply said, if you want to sell insurance in Washington state, you cannot use uh, um, your credit scores to uh, evaluate the person's ability to, to pay your insurance, et cetera. Okay, now that law was eventually overturned, but they had to go to court to do it. But that's an example. Now my opponent happens to be a major anti-gunner and she had a bill that basically said, if you, if you have guns in your home for self-defense, whatever, the insurance, uh, homeowner's insurance policy must contain an additional rider with a $100 million limit to cover uh, a discharge within your home against somebody. So a person breaks in your house, you shoot that guy, which you're legally allowed to do in a commission of a felony, and uh, is not in your house for any good reason. And then that guy would have recourse against you and have that million dollar policy to go after her. Uh, uh, restitution for him, not for you. So you would be paying for a policy basically for a criminal that breaks into your house. But the icing on the cake was the insurance agent would also have to collect your list of guns that you have and send it to the insurance commissioner's office. Now, this is not a gun registry. It is simply a registry of guns to the insurance commissioner not to the, you know, the, this, this, the, the state per se. So that's an example of using lawmaking in order to implement a policy. Now, I don't believe that the insurance commissioner's office is a policy-making office, okay? That's the legislature's purview. The insurance commissioner is really only supposed to be doing two things. One, he's supposed to be the number one thing the insurance commissioner is supposed to do is be the advocate for the consumer. So if you have a problem with your insurance uh, uh, company, you go to the insurance commissioner. The insurance commissioner is responsible or not responsible, but your insurance commissioner is your advocate to make sure that they are following the policy that they gave you. Okay. The second thing is the insurance commissioner approves rate increases. Now, everybody's complaining about the insurance costs going up, but most of that, and, and everybody, all the government people are trying to point their finger at somebody else, but the real problem is government. In Idaho, for example, an insurance company submits a, a, a petition for a rate increase. 30 days later, they get approved. 
30 days. In Washington, you're over two years, which means when that rate increase finally does get approved, not only are you paying for the costs going forward, in other words, insurance companies are going to come in and say, cars are going to cost more in the future, houses are going to cost more, inflation, et cetera. Uh, we need a rate increase because of these additional costs. But we also need that rate increase to cover the losses that we had for the previous two years that you didn't give us a rate increase. That's why you're getting 30, 40, 50% increases instead of five, six, seven percent increases. Now you asked me why I'm running for this office. A couple of reasons. One, the rulemaking ability means that somebody could walk into that office after getting sworn in and say, we're not going to do any of these rules. We're going to do something totally different, publish those rules, and 30 days later, that would have an impact on everybody's life in Washington state. No legislative approval, no governor's signature, which, by the way, would be great if I got elected, which would be terrifying if my opponent got elected, which is the other reason I'm running. She scares the dickens out of me. So... Wait a minute, you just went on mute. Sorry, I wanted to avoid background no noise. Um, okay, what would you say sets you apart from your opponent, Patty Cooter? So there's two different philosophies at war here. One is what I would call the free market philosophy, and the other is the, the big government philosophy. So how do we in reduce insurance costs? Well, how does the marketplace deal with that? The marketplace deals with more competition, typically results in lower prices. More competition, lower prices. Less competition, higher prices. My opponent's solution to everything is more government, more government interaction, more government involvement, more government uh, heavy handedness, if you will. And by doing that, that typically every time the government, I mean, I'm a strong believer in the less the government does, the better off we all are. So I want to keep as much government out of everybody's life as possible. And, you know, and, and again, another example, it doesn't matter where you are on the issue of birth control, okay? But it's an example. In the state of Washington, you cannot buy a health insurance policy that does not cover birth control. Now, that's because the insurance commissioner just simply made that statement, made that rule. Now, if you want a policy that covers birth control, buy a policy that covers birth control. What are you making everybody else buy that policy for? And when you, when you buy car insurance, for example, you buy car insurance and they say, do you want windshield insurance? If you do, you pay extra money. Well, what if I don't want a windshield insurance? And so those are some of the things that the insurance commissioner's office can deal with that would affect your uh, cost of insurance. Um, if you're elected, what specifically would you do to address the skyrocketing costs of insurance in the state? Well, I, you know, I covered some of that, but the, uh, uh, the goal here is to increase competition. That's the goal. So how do you do that? You increase competition, the number one thing that you would do to encourage more insurance companies to come to this state is improve the ability to do the uh, uh, rate increases in a reasonable amount of time. So there's a system that is called file and use. Okay, so Washington uses a system that says, submit your request for insurance increase, we, the insurance commissioner's office, when we get around to it, we'll look at it and we will grant that approval, yes or no. And again, we're taking close to, you know, sometimes in excess of two years. The file and use says they file that rate increase and they can use that immediately. Now, the caveat to that is, if the insurance commissioner's office does not approve that rate increase, then the insurance company has to issue refunds to all their customers, which they're not anxious to do. So what happens is you get, and if you don't believe me, just have Liberty Mutual. So in Florida, they had to issue $42 million in refunds because they filed a rate increase. 
went through the process. They started using that rate. The insurance commissioner's office in Florida didn't approve it. They had to then issue refunds of $42 million to their customers. Well, I mean, that's not good business. It's not good policy. It's uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, if you institute that file and use, it allows the insurance companies to go in, submit a reasonable rate increase that they know is going to get approved. And then you're getting five, six, seven percent increases. You're not getting 30, 40, 50, 100 percent increases. Uninsured motorists is another thing. I mean, the uninsured motorist thing has, has driven up because insurance rates have skyrocketed so much. It's kind of a double whammy on everybody because you're a responsible person. You go out and you get car insurance. Okay. Now your insurance rate go up and up and up. And all of a sudden you're at a point where you're going like, you know what? I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to roll the dice on whether I need car insurance. And you just don't get car insurance. So, in, uh, but that means that everybody else's policy is affected by that because we are getting more and more uninsured motorist claims, which everybody else is paying for. So look on your insurance and you will see that the cost of that uninsured motorist piece has escalated dramatically. And uh, so, I mean, a couple of things you could do there is make sure in Washington, you are required to show proof of insurance when you buy a car, but you're not required to get proof of insurance when you register your car. The other thing is, is that what people are doing is they get stopped, they get a ticket for not having insurance, they go out, they get insurance, they go to court, court drops the fine, and then they cancel the insurance. And once again, that's not something that's beneficial for everybody else. And... Uh, but uh, the other thing is, is uh, especially in your neck of the woods, because Spokane is kind of the example of what happens with forest mismanagement. Uh, I'm trying to remember how many years ago, pardon me, how many years ago it was, like four or five years ago, maybe. The, the Department of Natural Resources, which is required, which is the agency that basically uh, oversees forest management, requested a uh, burn permit from the Department of Ecology. And uh, they wanted to do a controlled burn to burn the underbrush up underneath the, uh, the forest to minimize that uh, kindling and all that stuff to reduce the high risk forest fire exposure. Department of Ecology didn't give them that permit because of smoke. And then three, four months later, the entire forest went up in flames and almost encroached all the way to Spokane. So now you're getting insurance policy or insurance policies not being issued or being canceled or are so high that people can't afford them in fire prone areas. Well, the Department of Natural Resources has grants that uh, you can apply for. for I, I don't know whether people know that, but you want to make sure people do, that they can cut back that, um, uh, make more of a fire break, for example, around their home and use more fire resistant materials, roofing and patent decking and things like that that are less prone to fire. And there's grant money for that. So Washington is the only state in the union that does not allow for discounts for being able to do that. So if I'm an insurance company and you, hey, you go out, you get this grant, you do all this stuff and you're trying to fireproof your house, shouldn't you be able to get a discount? I mean, why, why can't I? And that's an incentive that the insurance companies want to issue to people, hey, look, this guy gets a discount because he did all of this stuff. He gets a policy. You don't because, you know, you, your house is more prone to a fire. So if you do all these things, you could get the policy. You could get a reduction. But in addition to that, you know, one of my problems is the state of Washington, again, is, is required to do the management of the forests. And we want to make sure that people are able to get insurance. And one of the ways you could do that is, the, the state of Washington could say, for example, we will underwrite 20% of the property damage due to forest fire. So now I'm an insurance company and my risk just went down 20%. That's an incentive for me to be able to write those policies. Now to the taxpayer, for example, 
the uh, damages from forest fire, forest fire management stuff, doesn't come out of the general fund. It comes out of the rainy day fund. So when the uh, governor, for example, declares an emergency, emergencies are paid for out of the rainy day fund. So you could set aside, let's just make up a number of $200 million, and you say, we're going to allocate $200 million to subsidize those fire insurance policies by 20%. Well, what happens if you don't have a fire and you don't have those those policies even being touched? Well, that money is still there. So, uh, you know, but I will touch on the fact that you could do that exact same thing with school districts. So school districts, for example, pool their money and they create a risk pool. So 60, 70 districts get together and they create a risk pool and they pay for minor minor uh, uh, claims out of that risk pool. So um, you know, the state of Washington could say, we will add an additional 20% to your risk pool. So if you establish a risk pool, we will subsidize that by 20%. So if you got $10 million in that risk pool, we'll give you an extra $2 million. Now, on the condition that our 20%, doesn't get spent until your 80% gets spent. In other words, it's not 20% of every claim. It's the last 20% of any claims. Now, I want you to think about the impact on education that that would have and the benefit to the taxpayer putting money into education without increasing taxes. So now you've set aside, let's say, $500 million for that, uh, and you never touch that 20%. But you've reduced the insurance cost to every every uh, school district across the entire state, keeping more money in the classroom without increasing taxes. So that's an example of how you can, by looking at more of a free market approach and limiting liability approach, as opposed to the government being the insurer and the government doing things, okay, working with the private sector, you can actually do uh, have a tremendous impact. Earlier, you were talking about the problem of uninsured drivers. Um, you said they are one of the reasons car insurance costs are spiking. Um, if you're elected, what would you do to address that issue? So you kind of need to be looking at this. One, one thing you need to do, and it, and it would not be something that the insurance commissioner's office could enact. Uh, because now you're going into a policy situation. But the insurance commissioner could say, we need to have legislation that says when you register your car, you have to show proof of insurance. Right now, you only show proof of insurance when you buy a car. So every time you register your car, you got to show proof of insurance. We need to have a connection between insurance and the Department of Licensing so that we know when, when and if you drop your insurance. In other states, for example, I mean, they get pretty hostile towards uninsured drivers. In other words, you you go over there, you get in an accident, you don't have insurance, you lose your license. You know, in some cases, they go and they pull your license plate off your car if you don't have insurance. And uh, so uh, we need to do something that balances, you know, the impact of losing your license, not being able to get to work, et cetera, and all that stuff, and being able to have insurance. So some of the things is the, the minimum insurance coverage that's required in Washington is really quite low. So you have two groups of people, one that say it's too low, we need to increase it. And the other group that says, well, because it's, uh, we have this minimum insurance requirement, people aren't getting license, aren't getting insurance, and therefore we should drop it, and not have a minimum, so they get at least some coverage. And that's because you're trying to adjust this cost to the uh, lower income people. Um, but got to have insurance. If you want to drive a car, you got to have insurance. And you can't run the risk of, of uh, ruining everybody else's life because you want to save a few dollars. Is, is uh, you know, It's not prudent for your family. Uh, it's not prudent for everybody else's family. So. If you're elected, what are a couple of laws that you would push to get passed in the state legislature? Well, 
one of the things I want to do is accumulate data on who exactly are uninsured motorists. You know, who, who are these people and what is the data that goes behind this? In other words, is it somebody that has a lot of money that just decided to roll the dice? Is it a majority of lower income people? Uh, who, who are these people? So you want to be able to accumulate that data. And I believe that would require legislation. You know, and it's kind of right on the edge between a rule and legislation, but I believe that would require legislation. The other thing that you need is the requirement to say, you have to show your insurance, proof of insurance when you register your car, and then make that link with the Department of Licensing so that if a police officer, for example, pulls you over, he should be able to look up your registration and even see if you're insured or not. And uh, so that link would obviously require legislation and would require some expenditure for uh, computer stuff that the uh, and, uh, Department of Licensing would need to do. So those are some of the things that, uh, that I would push for. I would definitely not be pushing for uh, other stuff that would infringe on your gun rights, et cetera. And I know you have been talking a lot about gun rights on the campaign trail, and you mentioned that earlier. Um, could you talk a little bit more about um, gun liability insurance and why you're opposed to that? It's not gun liability insurance. I want gun liability insurance. Okay, I had a gun policy. Okay, I had a policy in case I shot somebody, right? If I shot somebody, I have legal protection. That's what the policy was for. I allowed that policy to expire. I went to renew it. I said, oh, I let, let my policy expire. I lapsed last week or something. I must have missed a whatever. I call the company up. I go, hey, I need to renew my policy. They said, oh, you can't do that in Washington. So now Washington is very difficult to get. Well, it's you can't get a policy that will cover all your legal your legal fees and uh, and your legal protection to protect your family should you engage and should you wind up having to shoot somebody in self-defense. But I want a policy that does that. So I would work to actually be able to have that kind of coverage. What I do not want is I do not want a, a policy that I have to pay for that would protect a criminal who breaks into my house. So I would definitely not be in support of that. So that's kind of the difference. Is there anything we haven't talked about so far that you were hoping to bring up in this conversation? Uh, well, we've covered a lot of the uh, the property, what we what would be characterized as property and casual casualty, which is homeowners insurance and uh, and uh, car insurance. The flip side of that is medical insurance. So you know, my opponent's number one idea in reducing the cost of medical is to have government universal health care, which to my mind scares me to death. I mean, we already have government universal health care in the VA system. I got my first three sons who joined the Marine Corps. I mean, try to get a dental appointment with the VA it takes three months, you know? Uh, my son had VA, so had, had minor surgery. He's got to go back to, he's got to go outside the VA to get it fixed. I mean, the VA system does not have the best and the brightest uh, as far as medical professionals. Um, if you have government health care, you would, you would in effect be creating a two-tier system between the haves and the have-nots. First thing that would happen was any medical professional that was worth his salt would be would simply not take government insurance. Um, so now you're going to get people, lower income people, are going to be stuck going to this government health care clinic, while people of means are going to go to a private doctor and should be paid a guy. So you're going to wind up with a two tier system. Second, if you think you have a problem now with an insurance company. If you have a medical problem, can you imagine what would happen if you have to argue with the government? Just ask somebody on Medicare when they have a problem, you know, or Medicaid when they have a problem. You know, you're arguing with the government on getting coverage and, and this, this and that. So extremely difficult. Now, the ironic thing is, you know, I, I had a uh, interview with the Washington Health Authority 
bunch of make up a bunch of uh, providers and hospitals, et cetera. And one of the questions was, high deductible insurance policies uh, have contributed to an increase in in uh, other uh, diseases, increase in, in diabetes, uh, difficulties, et cetera. Um, I am a strong proponent of high deductible insurance policies. If you put, and the reason for that, you know, high deductible insurance policies are uh, uh, way less expensive. And it's kind of interesting to me because I went to, I got, you know, I got insurance coverage. I go to the doctor. The doctor says, I, I'd like to get a CT scan. So I go to the hospital, I get a CT scan, and I come home. And a few days later, I get a thing from the uh, insurance company telling me that, you know, hey, we applied so much to your deductible, this and that, and on and on, you may owe. A couple of days after that, I get a bill for $5,000 from the imaging company. Now, oh, you got this premium plan. You got this... You know, uh, it covers this and this and this. Well, you're going to come up with 5000 bucks. That's a heck of a lot of money to come up with for one CT scan, for goodness sakes. And um, so with a high deductible policy, I'm going to back up a little bit and say, I never paid less for health care than when I did not have insurance. So didn't have insurance. And I had a problem, go to the doctor. Doctor says, you need minor surgery. So I looked at him and I go, well, how much? And he looked at me like I was nuts. He goes, I don't know. He leaves, he comes back and he goes, well, I guess my fee is $1,800. I go, well, how much if I just pay you cash? He goes, I don't know. He leaves, he comes back and he goes, well, I guess it's $1,400. But here's the hospital codes. You need the anesthesiologist, you need the operating room, right? So I call the hospital. How much? $11,000. How much if I just pay you cash? $7,000. Oh. So now I start calling hospitals. The cheapest hospital was Overlake in Bellevue. How much? 7,800 bucks. How much if I pay cash? 3,500 bucks. Ah. Huh. So now I find a doctor in Overlake. Make an appointment, go see the doctor. How much? 1800 1400 But if you do it on Tuesday, I do it upstairs in the private surgery center. It's only 900 bucks because I don't have to give the hospital a cut. So I get on the elevator in the building and I go upstairs to the private surgery center. How much? 3200 bucks. How much if I just pay you cash? 2200 bucks. Now, the point of that conversation is the price ranged from $22,000 to $3,200, and I put it all in my Cabela card, you got Cabela points. Now, if you had a premium health insurance plan that had your 60, 40, 80, 20, and all this other stuff, and co-pays, et cetera, because you got a premium plan that's costing you 15, 1600 bucks a month, and you went to that hospital that cost $22,000, you're gonna get a bill for $8,000 for your deductible. But if you had to, if you uh, took that and you had a high deductible plan that said maybe, you know, uh, uh, we pay zero dollars up to twenty five hundred bucks. Okay, well now everything over twenty five hundred bucks they pay. So now they're paying seven hundred, but you're paying the first twenty five hundred. But if you had a medical savings account, if you put a high deductible uh, medical plan together with a medical savings account. That's ideal. Uh, Obamacare kind of put the kibosh on that. You can't really do that, but you could request a waiver from Obamacare to do that. That's something the insurance commissioner could do. And the reason, you know, before Obamacare, the, the uh, I remember watching TV, there was a panel of a bunch of people discussing healthcare. And the, the CEO of Whole Foods said, we give all of our employees a $2,500 medical savings account. And then we give them a $2,500 uh, catastrophic plan. So now that employee 
has 100% coverage, but the medical savings account costs 200 bucks a month. The $25 catastrophic plan, and remember these numbers are 15 years old now, was only 600 bucks or 400 bucks. So for $600, that employee had 100% coverage. Now, I don't want to say I'm going to be a little bit of age discrimination here, Alan, but you're younger, right? The likelihood of you having a, a big medical expense, okay, is not very high. If you had a high deductible plan and then you had a, a, a medical savings account and nothing happened, you still got that money in that medical savings account. You didn't use it. You can actually roll that into your retirement account, okay? which would be a very smart idea instead of relying on social security, but, but you could roll that into your retirement account. So now that's a tremendous benefit, especially the people on the lower end. So when the government says, when you get these people that are pushing for government healthcare, as opposed to, you know, having these high deductible things coupled with a medical savings account. Now it's important to be coupled with the medical savings account because that's tax free dollars. So that's worth 20, 25, 30% to you, depending on what tax bracket you're in. So, uh, you know, I, I, I once asked the insurance companies, how many claims that you have that are $300 or less? And I think the number came back at 80%. So 80% of what the healthcare companies are paying in claims is your, you know, your doctor visit for $175, your, your prescription drug for $57 or whatever, right? So they're paying a massive, they're paying this number of claims, but they're all minimum, they're all small claims. They're not big claims. And uh, so you eliminate all of those with that catastrophic plan because you're just paying for all that stuff with your, uh, when you go to the doctor, you just pay the guy. So so now you got your plan ahead of you, Ellen. You're going to cover your, your, your health care. You're going to roll that into your retirement. You're, you're going to be doing good. And if you're lucky, by the time you get older, you won't have government health care. You'll have real health care. And besides, if Washington State had government health care, where are the Canadians going to go for health care? So that's the joke. That's kind of the punchline there. No. Um, well, I think we're getting pretty close to the time we have allotted. Do you have any other final thoughts? Uh, we pretty much covered the whole spectrum. Cool. I'd like to thank you for your patience because I may not look it, but I actually did spend a few days in a hospital and now I'm still on the edge of recovery, which is one reason why I'm going, you know, you're, you're struggling memory wise, but uh, yeah, uh, the cure um, for disease. Yeah, thank you so much um, for taking time to speak with me uh, on behalf of the Spokesman Review and the voters of the state. Um, we appreciate your time, and I really hope that you're on the mend and able to get some rest through a stressful campaign season. Um, but yeah, ballots go out for the state of Washington on October 18th, and they are due mailed back or put in a county drop box by November 5th. And along with state insurance commissioner, there will be a lot of other state executive races, I believe eight others on the ballot, including governor, attorney general, commissioner of public lands, and others. Um, so thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you.